Today is August 26th and we're in the home of Mr. Richard Baker here on Chincoteague Island. Our camera woman is Estelle Elliott and my name is Linda Lattice. We're both volunteers with the Museum of Chincoteague. And we're also very lucky to have with us today Jeff Clark, who is currently Chief Lifeguard at the Assateague Island National Seashore Park, a position that was originally held by, by Richard. So we're very lucky to have two people here today who's, whose experience spans about 60 years, or 50 years, some years, on Assateague. So. We're very fortunate. <laughs> a resident of Falmouth, Massachusetts, and uh, I grew up in Falmouth. I grew up in Davisville, and uh, that shows the linkage with the family, that why I'm Richard Davis Baker, mainly Davises and Bakers were originally there, so they called it the village area. No stores or anything like that, just houses, so on. And I grew up there, and uh, like in the summer, uh, most of the houses were used that were there because they were there for summer housing mainly. School teachers had them, for example, and during the rest of the year they wouldn't be there. And there was a man down a block or two away, he was from Larchmont, New York, had a shoe business. He came with his whole family every summer and spent the whole summer there and must have had a good business. He didn't bother to go back until fall. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was that kind of a uh, growing up, what I'm saying, and so I roamed as a child uh, the village and so forth, and we were close to Menard Beach, and I uh, loved to go walking, walking around the woods and then down to the beach and, and places like that. And um, actually, uh, my first swimming lesson, my father gave me down at uh, the end of uh, beach down at the end of Davisville Road. It was a sandy road, and then. There's this little beach here, which was public. It wasn't very big. It wasn't much bigger than this room here. And uh, my first swimming lesson, I didn't, I didn't anticipate. I was five years old, and uh, I was standing in the water a little bit, and he was in, up here, and he turned around, and he picked me up, and he threw me out in deep water. <laughs> and uh, uh, but he did it in a way so he flipped me so that I was facing shore. But I hit the water. Oh, it was uh, definitely over my head, and. Uh, uh, so I started, uh, I just really, I, with no, no, no background for it at all, I discovered the dog paddle. I immediately had put my head up and started doing this. And I, I think he wanted to see if I had enough sense to do something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and that was the last swimming lesson he ever gave. <laughs> he said, yeah, he did that all right. He doesn't need any help. You know, he's figured it out. And uh, I didn't inhale any water or anything like that. But it was, it was interesting because I thought it was a unique entry into uh, swimming lessons, which <laughs> with the, you know, it, nowadays, you know, you got to talk to them and blow bubbles and do this and that. You know, you just start swimming, you know? <laughs> 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 so anyway, at, um, but it was a, I was a, so I had a uh, uh, childhood largely in a village area in a small town. Falmouth there maybe had a population, I would guess, of around maybe 10,000. And but there was North Falmouth, uh, West Falmouth, Walkway, uh, Woods Hole. I mean, it's, it's a fairly broad area on Cape Cod for for a town. And so, um, anyway, that's where I went, went up to grammar school. And uh, from the grammar school, I then went to uh, junior high school. And in high school, I uh, played uh, football, and that was my main sport up in high school. And done. In East uh, Family Grammar School, 
uh, it was soccer and baseball I did, you know. They didn't have football at that level, of course, for sixth grade. And um, from there, uh, we went into the uh, Army and uh, spent uh, three years in the Army, two and a half of which were in the Presidential Army Guard in Washington, D.C. Very interesting and influenced my approach to later on to lifeguard, which... Oh, uh, yes, because you see, you you realize in a, in an alpha like that, you you know they gave you a couple of weeks to get up and, and special training, just just the new people coming in, and uh, so they uh, gave you two weeks to to get with it. And uh, I mean, they did things you, you ordinary army people didn't do. When, when it was manual rounds, for instance, was boom like that, and it was, I mean you did. There was no time to, to not be with it. I, the first parade I went on, I was marched at over to this, we were in, okay, Fort McNair is a, Gua College is on, Fort McNair on the tip of it. It's in an urban, urban part of D.C. Anyway, I marched over there with three companies, E, F, and G. And you marched over to where the buses were to load on for your Sunday par uh, parade over Fort Myers, because Fort Myers was 1st Battalion, we were 2nd Battalion. And uh, Fort Myers, for example, the A Company had Tomb of Unknown Soldier, and et cetera, et cetera, and others had caissons, and, the, and their job was mainly uh, uh, in Arlington, and ours was mainly cordons, the President was plane left, and so forth, brought in cordons at the airport around the plane and that, that kind of thing. Can I interrupt you just briefly? Of what year are we talking about? What year did you go into the Army? 54 to 57. And who was president then? Eisenhower. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's who. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Anyway, um, so, but it being, okay, so, so the thing is, they gave, you gave you two weeks to get with it. I mean, you had to do the speed they did and everything. So I, we were going on the first weekend parade, you know, as new people, and we slammed butts. That means you bring it down and you boom, you know. And so if anybody's not with it, you'd hear it. And what you hear is boom, company, boom, battalion. And when it was the uh, regiment, boom. It was all one noise. We all got together. You, you, it was interesting how I got you. Anyway, the thing is, um, I learned procedure to be doing it properly, and etc. And I learned from other people. Uh, like I was, I was going to finish, didn't finish up with it. We went to the get on that bus, and they gave autograms, and it was. <laughs> But not mine. Mine was still about that far off the ground, and I just held it, and I brought it down slowly. And this is how it worked. Soldier next to me, get with it. <laughs> that, that was it. No, nobody coming to just people talking to people, learning from people. And so that's what prompted me as the chief lifeguard, and particularly when it came to Assateague, because uh, uh, here I had a bigger staff than I had other places was to always work stand duty with other lifeguards. And as a lifeguard, I mean, they followed my overall stuff, of course, but the head guy ran it, the assistant head guy ran the daily beach thing. When I was there, I was just another guy. And my point was, I wanted them to see how I did it. And I wanted them to copy me. And a lot of them did and tried to surpass, and I, I loved it. And so that kind of ties in my whole thing with that period of time. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So did you volunteer for this unit in the Army? Or? No, I was, I, was not, I was out of basic training and I'm not, not yet in full assignment. And I was told to go into a room, walk up to an officer who was in front of his, on his desk, salute, and to, to an about face to leave the room. And then a couple of days after that, I was told you're going to Washington, D.C. Then when this is D.C., how you at, at least at that level, you can at least 
<laughs> walk straight, stand tall, and give us a look, you know. And uh, no, this, you know, <laughs> yes, so, uh, you know, boom. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, everything was just, and um, so the, basically that brings me up to, then I went to San Jose State and uh, after a Cape Cod Community College. And, oh, I worked, got out, I worked six years in my hometown of, home, hometown of Falmouth. And they were very um, typical and not greatly to my pleasing in a long way. I was, by the third year I was a head lifeguard. I was a head lifeguard for four years. And I, my year before that I was an assistant head guard for somebody because he, this fellow, he's, he'd been chosen as a head guard for the coming year after my first year. And he said he'd only take the job if I came as his assistant head lifeguard. I'm, I'm out of the service now. Most none of these guys are anyway but in college and so forth. They don't have that kind of a background. And uh, anyway, I like the way he worked because he was the one I picked out of, of the five lifeguards I was working with. I decided, you know, that there was no training, nothing. Just got a certificate. I went to a board of Air Force Base pool and got certified for a cross. And that was it. You're hired, you know, or you aren't hired. Anyway, so... Can I ask, what was required for the Red Cross certificate? At that point, it was just still seen a saving certificate at that point. But what did you have to do in order to get the well, certificate? I, I had to join a program that was uh, teaching, uh, teaching a uh, life saving course. That was being taught by a Red Cross field person who was in charge of a hyenas group and he was qualified to teach this life saving to other people to qualify them, you know. And so I got I went into a course that he was running. He had, he had the Red Cross had use of the pool and they let others come in and use it, including of course on, with program when they had to do it. It was, it was for courses going on. And so I went and took this course, and because uh, I heard about that, because he said, you know, I'd like to be a lifeguard, and uh, well, you need this, and so I went there and got it. And um, so. So you were a lifeguard in Falmouth for about six years after six years, the army yeah, service. Six years, and uh, one uh, one day when um, when uh, I got there and they just pulled a guy off my beach without saying anything to me and it was swimming lessons, I simply told the superintendent who was over there with him, painting stripes in the parking lot, uh, that if he wanted to get, have one of my guys in the future, let me know first. He said, if you don't like it, you can leave. So anyway, Cape Cod <laughs> Standard Times came out with a thing by the chief ranger that Cape Cod National Seashore was hiring lifeguards the following year. I said, so I wrote to him and I, I said, I'm not going to mess around with this one. I'm going to tell him what I want. And I told him, you know, I wanted to be there. I'd like to be in, uh, running some things in this program. And uh, that uh, I wanted a daily training for all lifeguards. I had a lifeguard calling the shots on the beach, what was going on and so forth and on. Getting away from this, I know, you know, he's with us so like when you know, and he can tell you what to do and all this. They either know the job or they don't, you know, just right. having a position somewhere. I, I didn't buy that. You know, if you got a job, you do the job. If you're qualified for the job, fine. If you're not, you know. So that's how I got hired by them. And uh, sure enough, we got people in from Rhode Island and New York and et cetera. And, um, that was some, they didn't, they, they weren't looking forward to what I had planned for. They realized I'm running a surf school, etc. And so I took them out there the first day, you know, and I said, okay, this was swimming from here to there, and uh, 500 yards, and the water was something like, uh, I think, 48 degrees or something <laughs> like that. And three guys threw, threw up by the time we got to the end of the 500 yards. They all made it. <laughs> I didn't put any time on it. I just wanted to get them going, you know. And uh, <coughs> but anyway, that's how it all started. And they hated me. And um, but they, the the park sort of didn't. <laughs> I said, "This is what we need." <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 
So I had, I had back in. And then, so one day, we came down there and they were doing a real morning workout, which was like we had a run, swim, run, and was part of it. You run 100 yards, swim 100 yards, get out and run 100. And we started the run, swim, run, and I realized everybody's lagging behind. I stopped and I looked around there, so sitting on the beach. I said, oh, what do you mean, huh? I just walked up to the district ranger's office. And I said, hey, is he your problems? And blah, blah, blah. And these are the two guys who are giving you most of the problem. And et cetera. And if you don't do something, you, you get problems that you'll never get rid of. He went down to talk to them. I went down and started doing my workout and ignored them and let him talk to them. And then later on that day, Rick came out, sent so and so and so and so requested to go to headquarters to see this. So blah, blah, blah. They were temp immediately fired. And so the guys didn't like me, but <laughs> didn't play games anymore after that. And so th that's how I get started going with things. And, and uh, that's why well, I'm, I'm bringing you into this background because the, the Mickey Mouse operations that were going on at so many towns and places and only was, you know, as one person said to me once I heard him say, <clears throat> well, you've got your certificate now, so get out there and uh, do what you have to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wonderful, you know, they, they, nobody, people don't know what they have to do, you know, they need guidance. Uh -huh. So that's what got me interested at, at that point in starting to research a book. How can things be like this? And fortunately I ended up here, from here, and we're, with Jeff following and Scott Allen before him, between us, you know, we, we get something going here. And the town of Shinkadi people were happy with it. Some of them at first, a couple of them didn't understand what was going on. And uh, they learned quickly though, uh, particularly with a couple of citations. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and but, but really, they, they had no idea. I mean, guy walking down the beach and drinking a Coke and like that, you know, into the water over there, whoosh, all that, you know, and, huh, what, what did I do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one, one runs into these things no matter where you go. And uh, Can uh, we back up just a little bit? I'm curious about how you got from Falmouth to San Jose. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I went to Cape Cod Community College. And I, prior to that, I'd gone to, when I got out of the Army, I, I went for one semester to Springfield College. And uh, I'd already been to New York, Massachusetts, but I didn't stay very long. I, I just thought I was wasting my time. I, I didn't feel comfortable with what I was doing. And I was, I, I, you know, just from the, a village, you know? And I'm groping around for what do I want to do, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, that wasn't it. And, um, oh, but it was funny though. I was had to take ROTC while I was at UMass. And at the, near the end of the ter first term, they said something, now the soldier of the month. Somebody walked up to me and put a pen in it. And I couldn't believe it. I said, I hate this thing. You know what I mean? But I tried to do what I could. I tried to keep posture. I uh, tried to salute properly and do all the things I was required to do, but I didn't like it. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> I was so surprised. And then they end up in the yard again. Well, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so you somehow wound up in San Jose, California, right? Yeah, right. So I went to, um, and then I'm going to Cape Cod. After I, then I quit Springfield. Again, I decided I was both times they put in for physical education, and I just, you know, I just didn't appeal to me as a, what, you know, teaching basket. You know, mm -hmm. Anyway, it wasn't my, didn't catch me. So I went back, and um, I was in uh, Falmouth now, and uh, so I, I decided, you know, I'm going to go. I, I didn't have a job at that point, and it wasn't summertime or anything like that. So I ended up. Uh, getting a little business uh, washing windows, store windows. And uh, while I was doing that, then I got a job, then I got into Cape Cod Community College. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a uh, car working at that point. And so, um, I didn't mean, have a car. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, 
I uh, had a bicycle, so I rode to Hyannis every day, a 20 mile ride to the school, and 20 mile ride back mm -hmm. to the school, and the only thing bad about it was with the uh, two or three dogs on the way. <laughs> yeah. And I had to kick them regularly in the snout. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't like that because they, they were tough dogs. They kept trying to pedal and kick a dog mm -hmm. at the same time. You know, it's not easy. <laughs> You're starting to slow down, and here's this thing. <laughs> but um, then uh, after about, uh, I'd say about a month, uh, somebody else from Falmouth knew I was, saw me in school, knew I was going to be. He just, I drove up with him. I was okay after that. And uh, so f from there, I went to San Jose. Okay. Uh, so I started looking at uh, school brochures and so forth and decided uh, I wanted what kind of a thing I wanted. I wanted something that interests me. So I got the San Jose thing and I, re and I realized what opportunities you had there. And uh, so I ended up uh, going there and uh, it got off to a good start because they were late getting me a, uh, giving me a letter of acceptance or something and then all of a sudden I had to be there and uh, so I wrote a, uh, okay, I was putting in for the Department of Law Enforcement and Administration because it had social studies, psychology, sociology were part of the social studies and psychology, I did try to say that, and I also was able to minor in history and philosophy. And so it, it gave me a broad, what I wanted, an education. And uh, so, uh, anyway, so when they were late sending this thing and all of a sudden I had to show up like that, I wrote a nasty letter to the administrator saying, pointing out to them that I was just coming as a student of uh, law enforcement administration, if they need any help getting their administration straight <laughs> out. <laughs> I was one. <laughs> uh, anyway, the head, head, of, head of the law enforcement department told me about the, the, he'd heard from the chief administrator, <laughs> and he couldn't keep from laughing. <laughs> I don't think you made any <laughs> friends <laughs> 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 and uh, so but it was very, it was very interesting and uh, I, that's, that is where I picked up records and report writing that I mean you can see now if you look at any of the stuff on PBS how Scotland Yard finally caught up with you know the uh, use of, of these kind of things, of techniques. They started following the Sherlock Holmes bit and so forth, finally, and <laughs> not messing up the scene and, and actually, you know, going through procedures and so on, and uh, finding out patterns and whatnot. And, uh, but they didn't do that for a hundred years over in England. And Robert Peel trying to get the police department going over there. It took him 30 years to get the bloody thing going. He a guy on his stature, he used a lot of stature. And uh, so I, I realized, you know, this is in, in my guy. Man, I'm keeping seeing things going back. This is because the way people act. This is the way people do things, not just in this and that. They do it in police departments here, education departments there, and so on, so uh, and so. Ah, okay, so anyways, uh, I stuck with that, and that's why I learned that stuff. That's why when I got to, he oh, so I, then I was chief lifeguard at, uh, well, I spent the first year I had to do a practicum. So I went to Yellowstone National Park, because I do it. To start, they looked at uh, the people who were the, the, uh, for the state of, of California. They wanted uh, to, yeah. okay, the park service that comes in this now. The Park Service had had trouble that summer with people at Yellowstone. I don't know if you remember any of that. It was about uh, all these students going in, trashing it up, smoking reefers and all that, the drug use, and all this was spreading big time into national parks. 
as well as other places in the world. This was when you get the student rebellion started to come out of this. And this was in what year? This would be in the 1961, 62. Okay. Yeah. Period. Okay. All right. And uh, so anyway, and they the so they can't come to uh, law enforcement department in San Jose, state California had, and they were looking for. Two students, one to go to Yosemite and one to go to Yellowstone, uh -huh, to okay. start for the for the to work with the Park Service people to upgrade their law enforcement, and so this would also serve as a practicum for my law enforcement program. Uh -huh, okay. So I got picked to go to the reason, of course, they were picking me was my background in Cape Cod National Seashore, and so that's what caught my caught their attention, and uh, so I ended up up there. And uh, which was an inter interesting experience. This is Yellowstone, Wyoming. Yellowstone, in Wyoming, because the Park Service, again, was just like Cape Cod and, uh, <laughs> public beaches. I mean, nobody told me much of anything. Uh, they simply said, "Here's where you're living," uh, and he, you do patrols here and there. And there. I was given no, 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 no breakdown or anything, and uh, so I was supposed to know what's going on. I said, "Okay, so okay, I'll go with what I know." And, uh, for example, I came, one afternoon I walked into the Old Faithful Station. I was in the Old Faithful District. Okay. And uh, uh, I walk in there and to the back door, and I come in and I see sitting over that counter over there was a young man. And sitting next to him was the assistant district ranger. Then <coughs> there was a seasonal ranger over here. And a seasonal ranger over here, and I noticed this seasonal ranger sitting there with his hand on a first aid kit, and he just looks at me. And I said to myself, "That never search this guy." So I immediately walked over and sat down right next to him. So I was on the other side, and the district ranger was on this side. This assistant district ranger was on this side, and so he wasn't getting anywhere. He went and he called the chief ranger. He comes back out. And he says, the chief ranger said to ask you to question him. So it took me about three minutes, and I simply said to him at that point, because I've been reading a book on interrogation. I did a lot of things. I didn't have to read that book, but I read that a good time because I've already read that. And I simply said to him, you know, you're only hurting others more than yourself by not telling the truth, the whole truth. All of a sudden he just starts spelling it out because he had a girlfriend over in the inn. And it, it, it rang a bell with him. You didn't talk threatening to them or anything like that. Just talk to them. And uh, so he's got all this stuff coming out. That ch ch this guy, this ranger, goes back and calls the chief ranger again. And he comes back out and he says, Stand up to the guy. And he's going to do a search on him. Right? So he's patting him down. I'm standing, I'm sitting here, and they're right here, and I'm watching, and he hit his back hip pocket right there. And the guy had a 38 caliber Derringer in his back hip pocket. This guy has now finally decided to fit <laughs> this guy. And all this is going, I mean, this is the thing where they said, why? And they didn't know how to question, they didn't know how to do anything. Anyway, so then he gets him up. Just the, the, fortunately took the derringer. <laughs> and well, I never forget when he hit the derringer, he dropped his mouth dropped, and he the gum fell out. <laughs> you know, one of the, the first class I went into at San Jose State College, they said, "Introduction to law enforcement: You don't chew gum, and you don't snap your fingers at people." And I said, this is this guy, the first thing he does is to go. <laughs> said, how appropriate why they hit the nail on the head. They know these guys. I mean, they had good people teaching. They had good people, former FBI people, former heads of uh, places like San Jose and so forth. And um, they knew what <laughs> was going on. So anyway, so this, so, so he says, okay, we're, we're taking him in now. And he, he didn't put handcuffs on or anything. Took him by the elbow, walked through the back door, and of course, as soon as the door was open, the guy took off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this 
is how the people can screw up. This is what I, I mean. People like me and Scott are fighting all the time. Is, is to not let people like this tell us how to do our jobs. <laughs> what we're doing wrong, you know? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, me and Scott. Jeff. 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 Scott and Jeff. All, all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, anyway, they finally found him, and uh, <laughs> I, I I was over, I walked around. Nobody said anything to me. I just walked over, and uh, I see him sitting in the back of a car, and these two rangers I told you about, the seasonals, were with him. One in the front seat, one in the rear. This guy's in nothing but chains. You know. <laughs> he, he couldn't, have, you know, he couldn't have done that. He couldn't have done anybody, and uh, except hurt himself, but. Um, so I simply got in the back seat next to him, got out a pen and pencil and said, okay, where'd you get this stuff you stole? Mm -hmm. Where'd you do this? Uh -huh. I just asked him, and he just re gave me all the information. And where were you staying then? Uh -huh. And that's anybody, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> then I, this ranger had pulled up, right? He was just below Old Faithful Geyser. Anyway. This was, this was in, right next to the geyser, the main Old Faithful. And uh, the poacher was probably wasn't spouting at that point. <laughs> 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 I don't know if they bother to think about that. They probably knew that, I guess. Give him that credit. Anyway, he was a jerk. Uh, he had his hat and he had a, his, 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 instead of his leather uh, placing here, pulled it down in front of his forehead. It looked like he tried to copy a marine or something, you know. I mean, and. Um, so anyway, I walked up to him and I said, "Is this?" I gave him all the information I had, told him where it was, you know, and so forth. Well, they got the FBI, and the FBI took it over, and I never heard any more from it. And that, 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 but I mean, that is an example of the type of things that some of of us are trying to change on certain areas and certain levels, and. Uh, it's 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 not easy because there are not people there who are now those those seasonal rangers yes no no problem with them I mean they knew what they were doing they were good serious people and they they just saw calamity everywhere and they couldn't do anything because this jerk was in charge you know but anyway uh, so then you, I, I think you it, you said to me earlier that. When you were graduating from San Jose, you wanted to come back to the East Coast? And, yeah. And yeah, so I asked, what I asked one of the uh, people from the Park Service. I had, a good, I had a good year on Point Reyes. Oh, the, you went to Point Reyes? Yeah, as, yeah, well. as chief lifeguard. Oh, okay. Uh, that was their first year of operation. Okay. And they were very happy to get me as chief lifeguard. And uh, <clears throat> I the Rangers wouldn't know more. <laughs> <laughs> the Rangers weren't doing it. <laughs> but I didn't know it. There were people I met at uh, Point Reyes, for example, who were, went very well in the park service. Uh, Bob Bobby, for example, uh, he went and he, he did well. And uh, he uh, didn't make uh, head of the park service, but he came close to it, I think. Anyways, but, um, <clears throat> and he got me later to come down to Cape Hatteras, because he went down there as oh. superintendent of Hatteras, so he had me down there twice, both to uh, train his lifeguards. Uh, <coughs> Etc. But um, anyway, uh, uh, getting back to my train of thought, which I, 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 I've hidden for myself for a minute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you went, to, you you went to Nash, um, Yellowstone, and then you were a lifeguard on okay, okay. Point Okay. When, when, when I got through with yeah, when I got through with the Point Reyes appointment, I was then graduated. Okay. And I wanted to know, I didn't want to go east, so I said to somebody, uh, one of the uh, rangers, uh, is anything opening up a new, new uh, seashore on the east coast? It's a place called Assetic Island is. And they had, they, they were looking for like that this year for the first time. I said, fine. That's so why I wrote to uh, superintendent, got his name, and told him uh, my ambition is to come here. and. Uh, be chief lifeguard, et cetera, et cetera. So he sent me, uh, hired me, and said you're going to be working down in Virginia. And that's how I got to Virginia. And uh, it says. And who was head of the park service when you came? Yeah. Well, we 
can come back to that. What year was it when you came to? Uh, uh, what year was it? 67. It was 67. I, I forgot his name. He was a little guy. Uh, so what were your impressions of Shinkati and Asati when you first came? Well, it was a small, see, coming from a small village, it was not, uh, not strange to me. And uh, the people were not strange to me. I, I walked into stores and, and people were very non-communicative. And I thought, oh, fine. You know, I'm not too communicative myself. <laughs> and I said, you know, it takes time for people to get to know people. There's That's nothing right. wrong with that. Okay. And uh, so uh, we had a few, as I say, a few incidents over there in which uh, we made it know, known that uh, uh, you know, it, it, this would not be tolerated now in a protected beach that these things, be, for safety reasons and so forth, and for sanitation and so forth. And we, we would get out and uh, eventually, you know, it, very, people became very cooperative. And I had a lot of people start coming over and saying hi when they came over and, and uh, et cetera. And uh, no, it all went very well and uh, very cooperative. It just was one or two other uh, people now and then, somebody like a surfer who wants to show off and cut over in the protected area. And uh, I, uh, one guy did that one day, he, uh, I won't tell give his name, he's a local guy. And uh, I uh, called him in and got a ranger to come over. And I told the ranger, I said, I want him sighted. And, uh, Etc. And uh, he, the guy looked at me and said, "Who do you think you want to make a Superman?" Because <laughs> <laughs> I called also in a friend of his who was, who was in a flotation device, which wasn't a surfboard, but it was still in the wrong area, and I went on both sides. Because I think you're either going to side him and not side him, because they're both in the wrong. This has got more of a dangerous weapon than has flotation weight, but nevertheless, you're both, you know, in the thing. It's only fair that you're going to sight him, you're going to sight him, you're going to sight him. So I'm going to complain against both. And that's when he just broke. <laughs> so, <laughs> he wasn't used to that. Well, he didn't do that again, you know. I just want to start off by asking how many people were on the... Uh, the differences in the Azatig and how the beach... Okay. Well, how, how it was different in 1967 this was, right? When you first think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, 67. Uh, well, there were no guards in Maryland that year, but there were five in Virginia, including my uh, five of us. And um, the following year, they had decided to open up uh, a beach on the uh, protected beach up in Maryland. So I recommended that the, the assistant in life that I had, a school teacher in Baltimore, uh, was excellent lifeguard, a regular employee, etc. They picked him as a, a head lifeguard for the following year. So he would be going up there. As he and I went up there to look the place over uh, one day. And uh, these guys were fishing rods were all over the place where you, you would presume you might put the fish. Uh, the beach. And I saw, I said, I said I, before, we didn't do anything initially, I just looked and watched them. And then I walked up and I told him, I said, why are you fishing out here? Because you see, I could realize it was very shallow. And I don't know what they're throwing their lines out here for. I mean, I mean it has to take on an off light area like that. So I'm thinking they don't really know what's going on out here. So, he said, yeah, we're, we're catching fish, you know, the, the, the fish are out here. He said, oh, okay. So then I went back to the other guy and I said, let's take a walk. So we just picked a place between two fishermen, not too close to them, and started walking out toward the sandbar. And we got about as deep as our knees, we couldn't get any deeper than that. And we, I, we turned around just before getting to the sandbar and slowly started to walk back and they were reeling their lines in. <laughs> <laughs> All the lines came out. <laughs> and we made that to protect the beach and got no problem with the fish. <laughs> so and that became the protect the beach the next the next uh, the next year. And um, this, uh, they had about, as I recall, 
probably five lifeguards the following year. And I, I cannot tell you exactly, I, I could look at my annual reports and get some idea, of that going back a ways, how many lifeguards we get. But we eventually approached, approached the number of lifeguards up to uh, uh, 12, I think it was uh, 12, 13 lifeguards we got to. We had five stands we were running, okay? In Virginia? Uh, or in Virginia, okay. in Virginia. And uh, so we had enough to run five stands, and that would mean we would need five on duty with two others in there, meaning seven would have to be on duty to run five stands. And we did do that. You got a picture in the book there of with five stands. And uh, if you count them and with a magnifying glass, but, <laughs> but you can see them, and uh, that's how they were set up in that year. So you know you can notice that. So when, um, yeah, I was going to get a picture of, of the book that you've written called Lifeguarding Simplified. When did you decide to start writing the book? Uh, exactly, I can't remember. I started taking notes, et cetera, and I eventually got to the point. Uh, I, I used to, I studied uh, the notes in the law library of, of the uh, suits, you know, for fun swimming and so forth, and that was a big help. That's how I got the chapter on uh, what uh, what the law was on it and so forth, and that because it's, it's in the law library, you know, in a good library. When I went to school, for example, uh, uh, they, they had little law libraries, like Michigan State. Well, I didn't even mention that, but I went there for a while. And, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that was the last one I went to before I went to, uh, to uh, get finished the master's degree. And uh, at, uh, uh, anyway, um, San Jose State, that's why I finished the master's. But at Michigan State, uh, they, they had a, I, I got a word from, from San Jose. Uh, actually, the, the, my, my, boss at San Jose had told me that he was the assistant guy because the guy who was the head of the, it was on, on sabbatical. And he said, if you get a master's degree, he says, uh, you had a job teaching for me, I'm going to take the job up in, uh, uh, it was in, uh, somewhere in Arizona, so Seattle, it was Seattle. So I went there and uh, they gave me a uh, job right away, an uh, assistantship which was simply going to the law library every week and uh, briefing the report uh, for, the, for the law for the uh, man, this man who was who had written a book on uh, on law on the legal and so forth. He, so I didn't. I never gave it to him. I handed it to, into his secretary. His secretary said, "I never get to speak to this guy." But I worked for him for two semesters. I got paid. I was enough money. Was was good pay, but then I decided it isn't the beach. Again, you know, I just had to get back, back to, the, to beach. the beach, and I said to myself, if I take that job in Seattle, I'm going to be in a city. I'm not that happy with spending my life in a city. I don't mind going here a couple of years to to, uh, to to learn something or whatever, but no, I can't see spending my life there. So I simply wrote the guy uh, my a letter thanking him, but, but, but uh, I was going to pursue j working with the National Park Service. And uh, so that's... Uh, may, may, so I, may I ask something? Sure, yeah. sure. So when uh, writing your uh, book or, or re researching your book, yeah. um, what, 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 did, what did you find that was most surprising? Uh, what's the most interesting bit of knowledge you obtained while researching and traveling? Well, uh, for your book. One thing I didn't mention, when I was in all these other colleges, I researched everything I could on life guiding, life saving, etc. And uh, what was some, uh, surprising things sometimes, for example, when I went to the, uh, to get to the Red Cross thing, I went to the Red Cross up in Fort National, you know, National Office, and I was told that uh, uh, Brian. Um, What's his name there? The, uh, I can't think of his name right now. It'll come to me in a moment, probably. 
I should see him. He was in charge of life saving and so forth. Anyway, so I said, I want to look at Longfellow's research, all his work. Where is it? There's a desk here that is filled with his stuff. And I said, uh, what's in it? He said, nobody's ever read it. Typical answer. Nobody has ever read it. Now, that's a real scholar. You know, I mean, they scholarly the I mean, you find it everywhere. And, and so I spent about a week going through all that stuff. That's where I got the material about Longfellow and so forth. I wanted to find out why life guiding seems to have gone the direction it's gone. Just like now it's gone in the same direction. Could they have all that concern about, if, you, if I'm getting off where you are, I'll come back to you, uh, about undertow. I had that when I was working in 57 in Cape Cod in, in, in Falmouth. How's the undertow today? Is it bad? I mean, these are diddly little waves coming in where, you know, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard's offshore. I mean, you know, no big waves were coming in in that section on Cape Cod. And anybody could see that, and there was no such thing as undertow anyway. <laughs> and so, yeah, but nobody wanted to face the fact that that's not, there's nothing happening on undertow. So I go in there. How am I going to on to this thing? Anyway, this was for over a hundred years. This was it was written up by the Red Cross. I pointed it out to My Myas. His name was Oren Myas. I said, Myas, you know why? You know if you got this thing, here, why? Well, this I didn't know about that. I just copied from someone's. No, no, that wasn't Myas. That was another. I'm sorry, I don't want to get into it. But Myas didn't have any answer to that. He looked at my research that I'd done and put it all down and says, "You've been around." That was the end of it. That was the interest of the Red Cross and all the stuff I did before I to make to put together for a book. I was willing to share it with them. Yeah, we were interested. We we got we got things going another way, you know. Uh, so anyway, so of course I didn't stop at that point. And uh, anyway, what was your question? So I guess yeah, I think you're touching on it in a lot of different levels. Like the most interesting thing you might have. Uh, Came up, came upon uh, during your, you know, your research and your traveling for your book. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's this mentality of how can a whole nation, and it, it actually the whole world, accept the idea for a hundred years when they've got scientists studying these things from Scripps Oceanographic and so forth, and that they let stand the idea that there's an undertow, right. and then. They drop it because now at Scripps Oceanograph uh, Institute of Oceanography, too many names go. Uh, one of them then uh, discovered rip current. What he called a rip current. Now, why did he call it? Rip, why did he discover? It? First of all, is he, they were in, Scripps was asked to find out why sand was leaving the shore and not coming back as normal. It was just not being replenished by other sand now. And so he went, put on a scuba deer and so forth, and dies and whatnot, and started. And he found out that there were a lot of places in California where they had these submarine canyons, so called, that went deep off from the coast. And if the sand that eroded during the erosional times, that is when there's heavy surf duty in there. Get kicking stuff up in the up in the water and get putting it in suspension and so forth. That as it went seaward, when when it's, it's dying down a little bit, they fell into the canyon and they left the beach system. So that's why can that's what he did. So he called it a rip canyon because when the, this current went out like this, it eroded into the canyon, and he called it a rip current. Now the bloody people, like the United States Life Saving Association and others, couldn't wait to have this. Ah, oh, they did not run to tell us it's rip currents. Now they get everybody in America screaming about rip currents every summer, and there aren't any out there like that. There are a few, like they always have been a few, and we've had about maybe five known rip currents in thirty some years over at Assateague. I mean, in all the years I worked, I knew of 
I think four at the most. And one I, 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 I was with, and the others were simply, I, I properly were taken by people. Jack Gillis, for example, he, he handled one with the Australians of all people being caught in it. But you see, when the waves break and come together, that they come into shore and they're breaking together. If there's nothing but shallow water here, they start to have that energy start moving back into deeper water. Because it's easy to move through deeper water than up a slope, right? Mm -hmm. And so this gives you a rip current. It's unusual. They don't happen. But you do have all sorts of currents out there. Because if you get the waves coming in and breaking, say, left to right, which is normal, it's going to break left to right or right to left, depending on how they approach the island. If they break left to right, they form on the longshore, or what I refer to because they do it in the scientific books, literal, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, literal current. And it's common to have these on, on seashore beaches. And so, anyway, uh, here you get the normal one. We have it posted every day. They put the cats put up what, what the literal is. So people have some. It's the, the other people who are, who are ignorant would say, oh, which way is the tide going? They think it's the tide. It's not the tide. Right. The tide goes in and out, and it's just a slow dropping, and it's not like a current here. To get a current from the tide, you've got to go to an inlet where a whole body of water is moving into a narrow section and then becomes a surface strong tide that you can see as you know the kind of boat can etc. But when it's moving on a fishing point and just going left to right as it breaks against the saw because it's coming in like this and it's bending because it's bent, it bends around fishing point comes like that it gives a literal current but it's not a significant one here but when it comes together with the other things coming in yeah, then you can get a tidal current very strong. I mean, because tides rising up is going on. In your 1972 Frontier magazine article that you wrote, uh, you talked about uh, the, some of the lesser known types of mm -hmm. seaward current. Why did you feel it was necessary to write about these less severe types because of seaward that's what, currents? That's what so many people are having to deal with, and and they simply don't. Don't, let me give you some clues on, on, some, on how to look at some things. First of all, a lot of lifeguards are not even considering wave period. Wave period every, every day over at SMT. Wave period. You get wave period and you've got also what I would call, uh, what is this called scientifically called, a um, break point. A break point. You know, break points are very important, okay? That's the point where a wave is starting to break. Now, in other words, you've got a wave coming off the sandbar, coming towards shore, and when it hits a break point, it's starting to come out of the form and break. And it does that in a statistically similar manner. It is a three foot wave will destabilize and break in four feet of water. Okay. okay. Now, if you know this, and you see a three-foot wave breaking, you know they've got at least four feet of water under there, right? Now suppose you see a five-foot high wave breaking. You could, because you can see these. These are on the surface. There's not hidden from anybody. The water down below is. Well, a five is going to be breaking at the same ratio that the three would be breaking. So it's three to four, five to x. So x now becomes your unknown, okay? Because that's the ratio you're going at. And uh, so if you've got four and four, and four that's four sixteen, three into sixteen. It goes uh, five times, point two, point one, whatever. And you've got over five feet of water under that thing. Now, what does that matter? 
Well, if you're a lifeguard and you've got a sandbar out there and people want to go to the sandbar and the tide's down and the waves are breaking on the sandbar and there's water in between the truck but you're not sure how deep it is or you want people going out there in these areas, you can figure out the basic breaking point of the, the waves that are breaking in that section. Uh -huh. So you can tell whether or not it's three feet, you know, people can go out and the children as long as they're with adults and so forth and so on. But if it's five feet, that's another story. Ch parents going out with, adult, uh, with a child at, fi at five foot depth, that, that's, that's a different problem. Mm -hmm. Life guys have to be thinking of these things and doing this. And uh, what I was going to get at with the wave period is, the wave period indicates energy, power. And if you get six seconds, and that's your average, which is six or seven is the average over here. And it jumps up, say, three points to a nine, or let's say to a ten. That's double. It's, it's exponentially goes up. So three times uh, five. Coming in every six seconds, that's That's normal. the average. That's, that's the average. average. Okay, average. okay. Let, let's, first of all, let, what's a wave? You have a curve like this, and go up to two points, right? And this is all considered a wave technically. from Not from wh where we think of it as a wave when it breaks. It's like that, and it's top of that, half of it, this half. That's a wave. It's just like a, you would draw it for an electrogram or something else like that. You would say that is the energy source. That's the place. So if you've got a six second wave as normal, and then all of a sudden it's jumping up, well, the, the wave height and the period are exponentially involved. They're both, because those two together and in the exponential form, give you the amount of energy in a foot square surface going in of, of, that, of, the, of the wave. It gives you that velocity of what the power that's in there. It's the main thing with the is the wave getting more powerful or is it not getting more powerful? In other words, let me take a short example here. I got a six second period. And I got a ten second. Yeah. It's coming from here and hitting you. Yeah. You see, so the longer the period, the more force it gives in to the break point. Okay, so now going back again, if you go up, uh, say, let's say from six seconds in the period to ten seconds, you get a hundred. If you go from two feet, the average up to four feet, what do you get? Two times two is four. You're, you're, not, you're not keeping up. The, the wave period is much more important in t establishing whether the strength of the surf is up or not. So, Fascinating. But and most people never count, never count the, the, the period. Right. They're completely unaware of this. They should be, and it gets confusing too because you've got to be able to pick out a real wave like I'm talking about that kind of wave coming in with little stuff on it, uh, little waves breaking over here, they confuse people. You've got to be able to get the wave out of that in your vision if you can. Otherwise, and then they got waves coming in from, say, off from Europe, this one's coming in from Africa, you know, and, and they come at different speeds and at different uh, uh, periods and at different heights. And so you're, they're mixing, and, and you've got to deal with that. So you clutter, get out the clutter, and you can't necessarily deal with some things. You, you're just going to have to see what's happening. But you want to be awareness of all this. This is what life guys should be doing, and not this game playing of, look how it's today, we're out, folks, you know. What are you talking about? What? Trying to scare people, and we're doing a good job up here, you know. And it's, a lot of it is, unfortunately, a lot of it is just PR stuff. I mean, Ocean City, if you look at the data they put out in their own publication with the United States Life Saving Association, they put out one example, one thing I was using, 
you know, in one paper I did, was uh, 3,000 r- r- current rescues that summer. I mean, we had something like uh, two at the most, uh, that is. And uh, didn't have that many rescues anyway. And if they don't know what they're doing. I mean, they, they're trying to deal with a very difficult problem. They don't have enough lifeguards. They're trying to space them out. And they're trying to get them hyped up. And I understand they have good intentions in what they're doing. They're trying to get the public alarmed so that they are, uh, you know, looking out. But, but it, it, you can't do it that way. You've got to accomplish it. You've got to do it in different ways. You're going to say, either, you know, go swimming here, you swim here, or whatever. You'll get enough nice guys or whatever. But if you don't, you end up with a bad situation. Mm-hmm. And, and people get up there and they don't know what they're looking at. And people drown. They don't see what's happening. Anyway. What, what in your view, do you, do you think is the most significant problem, problem in modern day lifeguarding? The same question. I well, that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they just switched from, uh, instead of trying to understand the surf zone and going to the scientists for that, instead of taking from them the rip current and putting it on everything else and saying, this is what it means, ignore what the, why it was named. Uh, the problem is that people are they're dreaming. I mean, you know, they. they They're not wanting to face reality, and uh, that's so difficult to deal with. I, I would tell you, you give you examples about it, you know. It's just like with the things, with the, with the homes things, how they show that so nicely. The guy comes walking in, with the guy, and the homes is trying to examine a scene, the guy's walking in there, stepping in blood and tracking it all over the place, so that you don't know where, <laughs> who's, who's, what happened here, you know? His butt is over there and there. It's just, it comes off of his shoe. It isn't his butt, but he's transported. And uh, to me, when you when you give people the kind of program that we've been giving them over here, you see, the problem I see that gets me into this, I think, goes back there, is I believe in our creation. I believe in nature. I think it's necessary. I think it's terribly important. People need it in these times more, if ever, than anything. And they need to go places where they can trust and have confidence. And that's what ultimately we've been trying to do, is give them their protection, but also with trust and confidence. And we've had so many letters come from people expressing this, in which they express very nicely calling our staff professional. And that's that's what we tried. That's trying to get. I think we have a society, a, a world of, it's a world problem of people going bananas. They need some release other than just twiddling on their phones and, and getting into a, a, and if they're in business doing something besides just internet and so forth, I'm not saying they won't do anything else, but and most a lot of people won't. But th- there are people out there that, who so enjoy a relaxing day at the beach, and if you can just give that to them, that's that's what you want. That's what we're here about. I don't look at myself as we're saving lives. Everybody's saving lives. I mean, the farmers are saving lives. Who who would make it without the farms <laughs> feeding us? Right. Who would make who would make it without all the medicines coming out that are keeping us going when we need them? Right. Everybody is saving lives if they're doing their job decently in some way or another. Don't let this stuff of well, lifeguards are really saving lives. Forget it. You of course do it, but you know also. Pay attention to what's going on. Give them reality. Give them truth, and and don't just give them this scare talk, and have them out there and ready to you know fall apart. And because we've had so many examples of people, I was I was on the stand with Dot Co one day, and we were. Uh, 
sitting, sitting there, and all of a sudden we see this guy, an elderly man. He gets really clobbered by a wave. He collapses, and we both out of the chair, down there, got him up, put him down. She immediately was at his head, checking his breathing. She said, he's, he's not breathing. And she started mouth to mouth. And I got ready for CPR. And so we were doing CPR. And then she said, I got an obstruction. So I, the guy was an elderly man. It was not very heavy. I just tilted him over and quick, about five quick thrusts on the chest. She said, that's enough. Put him back over. When the uh, uh, rescue squad got there, he was breathing and alive. So, and we both knew him, because he was from Pocomoke and Oregon. He's an old man. And, uh, but, you see, when you when you got things like that, you know, people like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't it's go It's an hard. incredible responsibility. Yeah, well, it's not, no, no more than anybody else, any number of others. Well, yeah, people have it everywhere. You just mm -hmm. got to be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you just got to be in the job and, and, and it's there. But I, I want people to be satisfied. And so many have come down and, and said, I know, I'm sure with it, it's the same with the experience as Scott has, that, uh, you know, uh, smiling. Happy, you know, right. you know, and uh, it's, it's enjoyable work. Enjoyable, yeah. yeah, you know. So, so for me, it's just a very necessary thing for our society, more important than anything. And uh, then I would say, you know, I'll, I'll surround it. Mm -hmm. it. It is that yes, and saving lives is good, and uh, letting people know it's what's going on is important. That's why we got into bulletin boards and putting things up. I mean, you know, if you've got information, give it to people. If they want to know what it is, they'll ask. If you, if you, you know, you have an opportunity to tell them otherwise. So, do most beachgoers here these days pay attention? Do you think to the most, information you provide? Most, um, I wouldn't say most, but people that are interested have the opportunity to look. And once you've got people that know what's going on, I think what happens is other people start to look at them for the answer sometimes. <laughs> I see that happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's there for them. And uh, I'm, I can't say that everybody looks at our signs. You know, A lot of times people want to come to the beach and mm -hmm. not look at anything. They just want to <laughs> get to the beach and lay down and relax, and that's yeah. it. But, uh, but the information is there, and that, that's what it's, and we hope to... Uh, spread that, I think, to people that are aware and want it, and then hopefully those people that are aware of, of it can spread that to other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, What do you, I ask you both this question, what do you think has been the most significant change in training lifeguards in the last couple of de decades, from the time that you started until yeah. Jeff came here? In the area of EMS. All right, probably. Well, even or uh, understanding the the waves and the beach and that's, current not, that's the trouble. That's what I'm complaining about. There's not much effort to, to really get people to understand these things. But do you train the lifeguards more thoroughly on those issues well, these I, I'm days? I'm not doing this anymore, but I was yes. interested in that. Uh, yeah, I would talk about the waves and so forth. But uh, I certainly do. You know, and uh, we've actually had Richard come in after different years and. And he would give a give a nice a talk on it at the beginning of the season, and I know the training time has gone up pretty pretty expo exponentially. <laughs> I don't know, not exponentially, but it's gone up a lot. You know, how many days did you have in, for training for your guards when they would come in? Oh yeah, well the first initially just five days. Five days yeah. Initially, yeah. We're looking at about a hundred hours now of, of yeah. total training. It's yeah. It's a lot. I mean, they, they have to be trained on their ATV use, yeah. and that takes a whole day of ATV training. So. Even if they, even if they were partially correct, where on your beach? I mean, you still got light guys that they're trying to figure out where. Right. They're just looking at the water, and nothing's happening here or anything. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what to look for. They have no 
equipment to deal with that. Intellectual equipment to deal with that. They, they just don't have it. They're not giving them look for the break, look for them to, to you know, things to come together. They surge. The water, white water come together, you know, and then it's going to go somewhere, you know, and if it doesn't go up here, it's going to go, and this one's strong and this one's weak, this one's going to overpower, but it's going to go off at an angle. You know, things like this, they, they, they don't get into it. They don't want that. It's too difficult. Just tell them the odds going to be and they'll be alert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I thought, they're supposed to be alert anyway. You know, you can go out there and just have a stomach ache and eat a lifeguard. I mean, you know, it's, it's stupid, you know? I mean, the whole approach is stupid. It's, it's pretending they're doing something, and they aren't. That's what I don't like. <laughs> it's pretense. Right. Let me go pretend time. Let's see. Um, so, in 1988, you were awarded the National Park Service Director Safety Achievement Award. Um, you know, you've had a, a really successful career. You know, what what is it about lifeguarding that fascinated you and kept you in the job for so many years? Love the environment. <laughs> it's hard to beat the environment. <laughs> I, no, I, I do. I, I love the beach environment. I, as I said, as a child, I grew up, you know, in the beach. You know, I always loved the beach environment. I loved the view. The view. And I loved the fresh air. And it's a good time of year to get fresh air. Uh, and uh, I find that um, yeah, I can help people do things. I can help them enjoy the same thing. And uh, not give them a lot of pretense. <laughs> look out for the other toe today. Look out for this. <laughs> look out for that. You know, roar, 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 roar. You know, just deal with reality. You you could have done so many different things, and I know you were offered, uh, a, you know, different position at some point at the park, maybe a historian or something like that. Uh, you know, why did you see, and you stuck with it? Nevertheless. Yeah, because that, that was, for me, was not challenging. And I didn't like the environment. Yeah. I didn't want to trade that environment for just an office. I don't mind working in a little office work. I mean, but no, I don't want to be confined to all, just office work and, and passing papers. Yeah. What, in your view, was the worst management decision in, during your tenure at Assateague? The last bulldozing of the dune at, down here in Virginia. I told my supervisor, and I know who made the decision, of course, who makes decisions on that level. And, and I said it, 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 that what they've done down there is the stupidest thing I have ever seen. Because they bulldozed all the remaining sand, which wasn't a lot, up into a pile, not a very big one. And at that point, there was no place to even put a chair when the tide was up. People started, I know this from knowing, people were closing their uh, lodgings in because they had no beach they could go out and use. And, I mean, they just eliminated the beach to save a parking lot, which, which was doomed anyway. And that's why I found it so incredibly stupid. I mean, yeah, there are people who know better than that. But the, the Park Service has been in touch with people like that for years. They're down at Hatteras, uh, they've been in touch with some people who know about things like that. And then they stop listening to them and they listen to some other one who's uh, pushing something else and got a program, etc. It's very hard for people who are not simply glib talkers sometimes to, to get attention. Glib talkers frequently get attention and it's a quickie fix. And we all benefit, you know, and nobody's benefiting. It's the same. Then you get this horrible expense of, of doing this thing here. So, uh, it's, uh, dealing with it. Anyway. It's as if it seems like we're in the same situation again today, you know, with the 
small beach area, parking, and not not a lot of park, not more room to. Well, I was like, to say what I think is the other day that uh, I recommended what's his name was the uh, administrator. Uh, Lou. 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 Yeah. Um, I said uh, I just have some unsolicited advice for you. And I said, you know, people are going to think this and that. The other thing it is, go down to D Dyke. You still, you've got a decent berm out there that's holding pretty well right now. And you've got a nice long area in the rear in which there's nothing but back growth areas. In which I'm sure somebody's going to come down from a regional office and say, oh, that's wonderful, that's all ready for a parking lot. I said, but don't do it. Put a beach out front and go back and put parking in the woods. Because you'll have it for many, many years. Which I undoubtedly he will, I think. Unless, it's, unless there's a huge, you know, change in, in the way the earth is reacting. What I'm hearing you say is give the give the beach a lot of room. Give the ocean give a lot the, of room. It's going to do it. If you leave it alone, let it do its thing. Because it comes from acres and so You get the storm stuff coming up. It comes up. It washes up. If you've got a dune... It takes sand out of the dune, and what happens when sand goes out from the bottom of the dune? Say, well, good thing we got this high dune up here. It starts dropping down here. They don't notice anything. Then it comes in again, and it drops down here. And they don't notice, and then it's starting to peel off now up on top, where the peak was. And when it gets up down there, I'll just do a slice of a little bit, and it's downhill. And that's what happens. Right. You can't put these monstrous dunes up and protect yourself from anything. It's not going to work. Nature doesn't know whether. Leave it alone, they come up, they do some erosion, you let, don't put dunes in front of them, they wash over, and as they wash over, they trickle sand back to the rear, because now it's going down, and as they drop it off as it, as it goes, and that's what you need to do, and leave it. And then you get the, so, because when you get the erosional periods in which the storm waves and come, then you get the offshore wind. And right after the storm, there's a lot of coarse sand in the water, still. And when the wind starts blowing offshore, it blows down the wave energy. And when you blow down the wave energy, it can no longer gyrate and keep that sand, the heavy sand, in suspension. It's all a question of how much energy is in the wave as to how much weight it can take. And so, it starts to drop the sand, and it rebuilds your dune. And the simple, I mean, the books are pretty plain and simple, some of these books that give you, the scientific books. When you got a, a beach, okay, here's the water, and here's the, here's the berm back here. When you got a beach that goes like that, that's a, a destructive beach. That's, that's, that's downhill. Which you when you get a beach like this and then drops down. That's a healthy beach. That is a sick beach. Because there's nothing but <coughs> it can't drop anything here and save it to mount too much. And because it comes up there and it's got that wash. And so what it does is it gets into the literal cone out here. Whichever the waves coming in this way, waves coming are coming in. And not normally what it does that down in this section good. It went down around Fishing Point. Fishing Point is what they call a recurve spit. And actually, the whole island here was initially a recurve spit. It's when you got to say you got a coast like this, no no island here, and the waves start coming around like that. That's the recurve. As the waves come around here, they're bending. As they bend, they stretch. As they stretch, they get lower. As they get lower, they can carry less. They start dropping things off. So that's the thing of how you get a recurve spit. And so this starts going more and more, and it gets a recurve spit. And then sometimes you get a little bit straight down here. Then you get another recurve spit. And that's why when you look at the maps of, the, of Assateague, it goes back in time, you can see where the Fertile Farmer recurve spits were. That started, it kept, kept it going for a while. And so 
uh, recurve spit is a good thing for growth. Right. But if you starve off the sand from going, you know, and any of the jetties do that, they stop the sand from going. They keep it within the jetty bit a little bit, but it's just a little sh like that and a little sh like that. And then the rest is the same old story. And then you get the things going around the jetties, and that's where people like they have a fun ocean city, they get rid of them. I mean, somebody goes in the water to swim, right? Everything's going this way, and they go out here, and they decide, oh, I'm going around here, and shh, mm -hmm. boom, and they go into deep water, because the they, they sand couldn't get past that jetty. Oh, okay. Until over here somewhere it started to pick it up. And so they get a guy in trouble right around the other side of the jetty. And yet, they, for years they kept them, and people kept me having re jetty rescues and so mm -hmm. forth. And, um, and, and uh, they finally get smartened up to that anyway, I think. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us about your experience here in Athletic and the profession of lifeguarding? Oh. Well, the professional lifeguarding is uh, a way to go, I think. You need to get serious about data. They need to get serious about taking good data. They need to get serious about telling people the truth. You know, try to uh, truthfully as best they can. And I mean including their own staff. No, that's how we handle it. That's how we, you know, the brush off stuff. Somebody got, just got to get honest and, and take an interest. In, but like the some of the scientists, I, I don't know, you know, they, they, they know things, and yet you look at some of the stuff they put out, they're just uh, playing the game of um, doing things to uh, do the paper. And you write another paper, and they, they, they follow the same old stuff. Writing another paper and another paper, and they get published, and they keep getting work. And, yeah, yeah, promotional, whatever you get. Anyway, it's, uh, I would just like to see people get really as serious as they are getting with EMS. I wish they would get with what's going on in, in, the, in the show. And not using that as scaring people to get them to do what they want to do. Because it's, it's simply being used as a boogeyman. What do they call it on the tow for all those years? Yeah. Well, we, I, I, you, if you read things I've read, you, you know why. Because they, what's his name and back in 1824 or whatever, wrote a book using the term. Former sailor with uh, uh, good experience and, and people respected him. And ever since then, everywhere has been undertowing. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, until now it's Rip Kearney. And, and what do you see? How do you feel if you go down to a beach, you're so so swimming, and you've got that moving seaweed, and you're thinking Rip current. Right, panic. And what does that do? Panic, yeah. People still go to places like Hatteras and do get this kind of thing, in particular, it's a good example. <coughs> the heads, what do they have? Two, three lifeguards at the most on some of those beaches now? if they have any at all. <coughs> they, and then, you see, one of the problems with the park service is you've got the competition felt by some of the parks that <coughs> they don't want lifeguards competing. Competing for what? Well, money, resources, uh -huh. etc. Uh -huh. Prestige, uh -huh. calling the shots. Okay. All right. Uh, I know guys that went, for example, to uh, Acadia, and uh, he's was trained over here for, for years, and uh, they had a problem, they needed a resuscitator, they didn't have one. Uh, he, he'd ask for one. No, they'd ride around in the ranger truck. The rangers had the resuscitators. For years we had a problem here. Uh, for about six years or so, that we came in here. The maintenance crew was was great. They built first aid kits for us. We'd come back the next year and they'd be in ranger vehicles and we didn't have any first aid kits. The maintenance crew, great guys. 
Turlington and the others, they built them for us again, year after year, and the bloody rangers just heisted them as soon as the season was over, put them in their trucks. And I mean, that's when you have to deal with that. Finally, I had a chief uh, ranger who said to me, <coughs> you know, as far as I'm concerned, your beach district is just another equivalent to other two ranger districts. I'm giving you your own set of keys, etc., etc., to keep these guys from opening our locks and taking what they wanted in the summer. And uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy being the lifeguarding. It's not easy sometimes because if people get this, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about them, you know, they, they're not as important as we are. And we like being, that's the, Moki the Bear image and all that, and people are just trying to get a job done. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, and so it's, it's, it's not easy sometimes. And so lifeguards need support as lifeguards for what they do, some understanding. That's why I try to get information out. I drop some off at the uh, place, for example, sometime back. And I, wherever I can put it, well, that's, that's somebody I know. <laughs> if you yes, would like to we look skipped up, over the other information you were going to... Did you want to look upstairs at all? Well, I wanted to hear about how you met your wife on the house. Well, I better tell you real quickly. So tell us how you met uh, um, your wife. Her name is Anna, right? Anna. Anna, okay. H A N N A. Okay. Anna, Anna Laura. Oh, beautiful name. So, uh, when and how did you meet her? I was on the beach past um, the Fish and Wildlife crossover at D Dyke. And uh, it was a log. And I had decided to lie down there behind, behind, behind oh, next to the lock. And then I see some people walking up the beach. Unusual. In those days, I was 67. And there was this woman with two other women. And this woman was holding her bra like so. So I realized she apparently hadn't been wearing the bra. <laughs> and um, I thought a very sensible woman. <laughs> Getting suntan. Yeah, well, why not? I mean, out here nobody's around, you know. And um, so they just, they, they were curious. They'd seen the log and my hat or something. And they just came and uh, were, were curious, you know. And uh, so, you know, you know. Okay, turned around, and went back, and uh, I, I, I had permission in those days to, to, to take my bicycle up there. They didn't yet come out with a you know, bicycle rule or something like that. So I did get permission from the uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife people, the uh, <coughs> manager there. And uh, oh, I was just the manager, whichever one. Anyway, so I was going back eventually down the beach. I get down somewhere near the protected area, and I saw these women here, and I recognized her as one of them. She turned around and held up an egg, and I hit my brakes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I brought the bike over, and uh, went up, had an egg, <laughs> and uh, we were talking, all of us, and uh, well, then we just went from there. I can't remember exactly uh, whether she came down the next weekend or what. But anyway, she came see me and got up with me and uh, we got together. And, uh, so she came down regularly for a while. And then when the off season uh, and I was unemployed, I uh, went up and stayed with her up in uh, Arlington. And, uh, so we went through that routine for a while until I get more employment with Park Service. And eventually they, um, after being turned down by the, by the director even, for the three, I think twice they put me in for permanent and it was turned down by the director. Finally, 
I think I had a director who approved it. And so I had a full-time job, in which eventually I could uh, make 11 months employment per year. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how we met, and that's how we got together. And uh, then eventually she uh, decided to quit her job, came down here. And, oh, we decided to get married, I think, around 1972 or something like that. And, uh, so, uh, well, I think it was 74 she came down here. And, uh, well, we'll, we'll think that things went from there. I, we've lived in about, uh, three different houses since we came here. One on Princess Street, uh, another one on Booth Street. And briefly, one in uh, Oyster Bay, and then here, we've been here for well over 20 years. So, uh, that's where we are. It's a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you think so. So the, <laughs> so the beach has given you a lot in your life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. It has, it has uh, been... It's, Part of everything. Yeah. Part of it. Yeah. Met some nice people like Jeff and uh, a lot of good, a lot of good little good lifeguards who worked over here. We had fun together. I mean, you know, fun. I mean, just enjoyed each other. And uh, uh, I don't mean going out and drinking and stuff like that. I just mean we just enjoyed uh, comment. We comment. We had uh, in the car system put up for years. Worked and uh, it uh, went into the uh, district office until eventually the erosion kicked that out and we went to another farm of radio use. And uh, we had to be a little more circumspect on radio use. <laughs> 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 and we <laughs> did on the intercom. Yeah, we had some kind of funny things happen on the intercom. <laughs> But, uh, Is there anything else you'd like to add? My and, goodness, uh, I've made so many comments. <laughs> uh, I don't know what else I could make a comment that would be worth saying. Except that uh, I'm glad Jeff got to meet you. Yes. And, uh, because whatever is anything you could gain from all get to, to the recreational atmosphere of the beach, to be part of it and get proud of it. And uh, we've always tried to get along with the townspeople and have the tip of the fur, a few odd balls, of course. That's, a, that's, a, that's unavoidable. I've been so lucky to uh, have known Richard and also Scott, who, was, uh, who I worked with for 12 years on the beach, uh, mentors uh, in, in the field that I'm in, and both of them. And uh, yeah, it's brought me a long way. I've learned a lot from, from both Scott and uh, Richard. So, especially reading the book here, over and over again. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I think Shinkatinga Nasati uh, or owe a great deal to all of you for the part that you play in, in fostering the tourist industry here, and, and even locals. I mean, we all just love the beach and being out there. So, it's a, you're, you're a tremendous asset to the community. Well, that, the thing is that they see this is one one community I know that I've met, uh, many I've been to, who appreciates that. And I'm not sure my hometown people appreciated, they didn't have as much to appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think they didn't have that relationship, I don't think. They had more of a thing like, um, I'm a this, I'm a school teacher, I don't know what I can tell anybody what to do, you know. Uh, you guys are just like that to the summer. And it was all Mickey Mouse. It didn't have anything to do with real work. Mm -hmm. but, uh, reality. I always liked the idea of living with reality as much as I can, at least. And that's one thing I, with a job like this, I was able to do. Yeah. Plenty of challenge, isn't it? Well, thank you very much. It's been well, fascinating. You. I appreciate you taking the time. I mean, I went to the post office once, and I, I came up, 
and I heard this, this woman look too cute, you know, two older people, looks at her husband, and I know she was talking about me, hasn't licked the face look in his life. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, that's not true. I've been, I've seen him work. <laughs> I figured, well, you know, at least that's one and one. <laughs>